we might uh, we might get started. Uh, so, welcome everyone to the third in our Faculty of Science Climate Change Seminar Series. Uh, today's speaker is Professor Doug McFarlane. Like all of the speakers so far, Doug comes with quite a humbling and um, extraordinarily impressive track record, both in academic achievements, leadership, and also impact. So Doug's, uh, just to name a very few of his achievements, he was a former head of School of Chemistry, he was elected to the Australian Academy of Sciences as a fellow in 2007, he's a former ARC laureate fellow, um, he is uh, one of the founding directors, I think, of, of Jupiter Ionics, which is a spin-off company, he might talk a little bit about that today. Yep. And he has quite a mind-blowing um, statistics of citations of 65,000 sites in an H index of 119. I've, I've started looking up these things for, for fun to see, to see the, the mind-blowing numbers that our, our speakers have been having. Uh, so without any further ado, um, oh, one more thing I wanted to say is that the, the, the thing that I really love about Doug's research is it combines two things that excite me a lot, which is renewable energy and the nitrogen cycle. I had to throw that in there. I had to throw that little quip in. So without any further ado, uh, I'll let Doug um, talk about uh, his work. Thanks, Doug. All right, thanks, Perrin. And uh, and yeah, there's a little bit of, well, not a little bit, there's a, an important slide about the nitrogen cycle at the very end here as, a, as an important um, reality check for us all in this uh, otherwise, you know, high voltage excitement of uh, what's possible here otherwise. Um, so thanks everybody for, um, for for joining us this morning to talk about this uh, this this potential for um, what I've called here the hydrogen ammonia economy. So are you guys are seeing this, I think. Yes. Um, maybe I'll start the presentation. That's the thing to do. Yes. Um, uh, which I mean, we've we've all been brought up, I think, with uh, with the hydrogen economy as one of those lovely dreams that uh, seemed the the answer for the the energy supply of the future, renewable energy supply of the future. And it seems to be happening right now. But uh, while that was happening, um, an important sort of side branch grew into a very serious um, branch of the whole story, um, which is ammonia. And we've started after a, a, a certain um, provocative um, outcry um, to a paper we, we wrote a couple of years back called a Roadmap to the Ammonia Economy. We've started calling this the hydrogen ammonia economy because the two ideas are, are intimately overlapped and, uh, and um, uh, synergistic with each other. So I'll try and explain all of that as I go through. Um, so um, the, for me, the, the story uh, very much starts with a, a map like this, which uh, shows you the total solar insulation averaged over the whole year and night and day, summer and winter, um, at different points on the planet. And the, the, the colored um, line at the bottom um, ranges from, from the very almost dark brown uh, color, um, which is nearly 300 watts continuous because it's averaged, 300 watts per square meter of energy raining down on the, on the planet. Um, to the the the, the moby purpley colors, which uh, which are less than a hundred watts per. Look at kind of where those regions are. <laughs> includes most of Europe. I always amuses me when I look at uh, when people talk about Germany and the UK in terms of, of solar energy, and it's a matter of <laughs> uh, that's nothing quite like what's possible in Australia. If you look at um, at the map there, and uh, and simply put, uh, the same solar cell in in uh, in that very intense region of the middle and the northwest of Australia is about three times the same solar cell cells, but three times more productive. Um, that little yellow box is, is provocative, uh, makes you think. Um, that's an area that's 250 kilometers by 250 kilometers. And if you put ordinary commercial solar cells on that, and the details are on the bottom of the slide there, um, you can generate 25 petawatt hours of energy per year on, in, on that area. Now that's the electric supply of the whole world, right there on that little yellow square. And, and that area, by the way, uh, to put this in perspective, is about the combined area of Australia's four biggest cattle stations. And we're not supposing that you'd put um, solar cells uniquely on that one little spot. Of course, it'd be spread around um, various places. And uh, I don't think there's any doubt that the cattle farmers involved would um, be quite happy to have some additional source of, of income, sort of solar farming as part of it, as well as, as cattle farming. So the so the the energy is there, and there's nowhere quite like it uh, than Australia to generate that energy uh, on the planet. Um, 
And this has other sort of uh, provocative things to think about. Here's, a, here's a, a similar map, this time from the Bureau of Meteorology. Um, same, same story, just different numbers if you want to follow the, the numbers there. But I marked on this map um, a few important points, uh, uh, locations in Queensland of political sensitivity. So there's the, the Carmichael coal mine, the Boyne Island aluminium smelter, which is very uh, important in, in, uh, to the Queensland uh, politicians, and Collinsville as one of the typical um, mining, mining based uh, rural uh, regional um, uh, towns that's very sensitive to what uh, the energy future of the country is. And if I haven't sort of shown you uh, without actually explicitly ex uh, talking about it, how you could use all that lovely energy that's uh, solar energy that's available in that uh, yellow region across the, the country, including um, uh, Western Queensland, uh, how you could use all of that um, to, to create an industry which is generating ammonia, which is running the Boyne Island uh, aluminium smelter and uh, avoiding the need for the Carmichael coal mine. If I haven't done all that uh, by the end of this talk, then please, please ask me just sort of how, how does that connect, but it certainly connects. Um, now, one of the problems that we have in, uh, in, in imagining this, this, uh, this lovely energy concept for the future is, well, we, we know where we can generate this energy. Um, uh, the question is, how do we get it out of here? How do we remove it from, from uh, the stranded energy areas where it's generated to the, to the markets, both within Australia and to the huge um, population centers to the north of us? Um, and there's an important arrow there leading from the southern part of New Zealand as well. I can explain if anybody's interested. So, but the basic question here is what's in that boat? Um, what is in that boat? And, um, and this is of, of intense interest in, in, in Asia in particular. I mean, Japan has, has long led the way here. Here's a picture of, of um, a gathering in our uh, labs just before COVID hit um, January of last year. Um, a deputation led by the a Japanese Minister of Economy, Trade and Industry, very much engaged in, in ammonia um, and uh, hosted um, throughout this uh, by um, Senator Birmingham. Um, and uh, Japan has long, long talked about ammonia as being its energy import vector um, and has been encouraging countries like Australia to consider how we could be exporting it. So. So I've jumped to ammonia. The question is, well, how do we get to ammonia? So let's go back and, and talk about how do we export this uh, or move around this, uh, this uh, energy that we, this renewable energy that we can generate. And we've called this, we dubbed this liquid sunshine. Uh, it's a lovely concept, um, but it, it needs to be turned probably into some liquid form in order to carry it around efficiently. So the first, the first way to think about that, of course, is hydrogen. Liquefied hydrogen, moving around large vol volumes of gaseous hydrogen is just, is just un unpractical. But liquid, liquid hydrogen also has its challenges, but it's clearly the, the, um, the hydrogen um, uh, economy that we've been talking about. And before I, before I sort of go any further than that, I, I'm always reminded here about a little bit of history in our group about that term liquid sunshine. Um, so we, we dubbed a paper that's referenced a few times throughout this talk, um, uh, something about liquid sunshine that was in the title of the paper. And uh, just at proof stage of that paper, um, one of my people came into my office and said, Doug, where did you get that liquid sunshine phrase from? And I, I actually couldn't remember. And I thought it was probably some journalist or other, or other that had sort of mentioned this as a lovely concept to me. Um, and, and she said, oh, you better look that up before we just finalize these proofs and uh, to search it on Google. So I did. And uh, within a couple of, of search links uh, from the top of the page, you come to the, the um, online, what is it, slang dictionary here. Um, and you'll find that liquid sunshine is a slang, a slang uh, term for LSD. So we thought that was probably not a smart idea. We could just see the headlines, you know, Monash Professor plans to create new um, LSD export industry or something like that. Um, so we changed the paper to liquefied sunshine, but we still use the liquid sunshine idea in our yeah, locally. Okay, so back to hydrogen. So hydrogen is easy, to, relatively easy to make. Um, many of you will have done an experiment a bit like uh, the one on the right, um, maybe at, uh, at high school or in, in undergraduate. Uh, I think I probably first did this at home in my 
my bedroom, much to my mother's disgust when it spilt all over the carpet. Um, but uh, and so hydrogen is easy to make, but but moving it around is is tricky. It's uh, liquefying it has to go to very low temperatures and is very energy consuming in its own right. And then and it's a whole technology that is largely undeveloped at the moment. So so while it's the obvious fuel, a clean fuel, there's no carbon involved. It 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 has its limitations that have, have yet to be fully resolved, shall we say. And of course, in thinking about moving it around in as yet undeveloped tankers and of large scale, et cetera, et cetera, you know, everyone th always thinks back to the to the Hindenburg disaster, which of course is gaseous hydrogen, not uh, not liquid hydrogen, but nonetheless, um, the safety concerns around such a flammable gas um, uh, remain. So, so the world then has started to think about further variations on this, and there's a the second generation that we, we refer to here as what you can do if you've got green hydrogen from water electrolysis from renewable energy. So all of this is happening. This is actually happening on the far northwest of Western Australia. Um, uh, you can make ammonia, ammonia using the traditional chemical engineering Haber-Bosch process that I'll refer to a few times during this talk. So it's a, it's a large scale, uh, mega scale uh, chem -eng type of process that, um, that makes ammonia. Traditionally, for fertilizers today, and that's an important part of the story, um, but could be for effectively as an energy vector in the future. And ammonia is much more uh, easily moved around. Um, as you see, can see there, its energy content is quite high at 22 megajoules per kilogram. It's about half of that of, of, of petrol. Let's keep that in mind. And you can liquefy it at 12 bar at room temperature, 12 atmospheres. And that's so, so now I think. Uh, LPG, right? So it's it's no more difficult uh, to to move around than LPG, and that's a and that's a already quite a lot um, easier to move around than, for example, LNG, which is natural gas liquefied at uh, considerably lower temperatures. So so the refrigeration aspect of this is no no longer really needed here. But Haber Bosch is still an important part. Now that's that's already a concept that is. Is is being developed. This is this picture is the um, the Yara big international fertilizer company runs a Haber Bosch plant in Karatha and in, in the Pilbara. Uh, and you ask why is it all way up there? Um, and the answer is that's where the natural gas is. That that is how um, ammonia is made today from natural gas, carbon polluting process, which is the basis for all our food, of course. Keep that in mind. Um, okay, so. How does that fit then into this this um, this hydrogen economy? So this is how this evolved over the last maybe it's only the last five years or so that this has all been happening. So the idea is 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 as follows: you take hydrogen, green hydrogen, you turn it into ammonia in a plant like that. Ammonia is relatively easily moved around. Ammonia shipping is is a standard technology. Pipelines in in a number of parts of the north of, of the northern hemisphere of, of ammonia all doable. Um, ammonia then is easily, relatively easily cracked it back into hydrogen and CSIRO developed a, a cracking technology for that. So that's been, been, been developed further by Fortescue Industries at the moment. Um, back into hydrogen, and this, this process at the top could be happening in the fill station in the center of Tokyo. So we don't necessarily need to move large quantities of hydrogen around. We just need to create it in the fill station and, and pump it into the to the Toyota Mirai here, which is the Toyota fuel cell vehicle. So that's how it fits a, as a, an energy vector for hydrogen energy is one concept for ammonia. However, it gets better because ammonia is actually well known as a fuel. You can run an engine, and this is this is not new news. This has been uh, this was was done in the Second World War in Belgium in, in 1943. It had a fleet of 100 buses running on ammonia because they didn't have large quantities of fuel. Not hard to run an ordinary engine on ammonia as a as a fuel. Um, it, it, think of it as being like an LPG type of setup in the in the vehicle. So it's a it's a liquid fuel in once compressed and then as it's released, the pressure is lowered going into the engine. Then it's running in as a um, as a gas like uh, LPG would. Um, more modern views of this, of course, is that you can actually run uh, a power turbine, like a gas turbine for generating electricity. This is a version that runs from Mitsubishi, runs on ammonia. So this is starting to happen in Japan. Um, the future of shipping is now seen uh, as the only way to achieve 2050 type goals for shipping. Um, it's now widely recognized the fuel is going to have to be ammonia because there's really nothing else quite like it to run these massive tankers on. And um, 
uh, you know, there's a number of, of large shipping and uh, shipbuilding and other companies looking at how to do this, what kind of ships need to be built, and demonstration ships are, are including large marine um, ammonia burning engines um, being, being trialed at the moment. And one of the key things is it can be mixed with, an, with traditional fuel oil to, in order to um, um, stage the, the, the changeover. It's not one or the other. Um, believe it or not, I find this hard to believe when I first heard about it a couple of years ago, even, even jet aircraft. Um, so the, the jet engine, ultimately, if, if you feed it with ammonia, by the time it gets into the engine, it's, it's, uh, it's already dissociated into hydrogen. So it's like running the engine on hydrogen. Um, and otherwise, the jet engine is, is, is a very, very similar device. There's no real re-engineering of the jet needed. Um, and it's quite likely that um, the energy density of ammonia would tell you that it's quite likely that it would never be the answer for long haul. It's not, it's not energy dense enough. Uh, on the other hand, short haul, very small aircraft running for half an hour or so might be batteries. But for Sydney, Melbourne and Sydney, Brisbane and so on, that's probably in the future going to be ammonia. Um, and another, another example of using it as a mix, uh, um, Japan is already, uh, this is from the Australian Financial Review from a week or so ago, or a couple of weeks ago, um, trialing ammonia um, as a mixture, uh, co-firing into a power plant with coal. So uh, ammonia clearly has a, a role, um, not only as, a, as a, an energy carrier for hydrogen energy, but it really has a role as a fuel in its own right. Once you've got it, you don't necessarily need to reconvert it back into hydrogen to do all of those things that I just said. Um, that then makes us um, uh, ask the question, is there a, a better way than this double step, uh, two-step process of making hydrogen first and then making Haber Bosch? Can we go directly from energy to ammonia? And that's the process we call direct nitrogen reduction. Um, uh, and that's what I'm going to talk about for the next uh, 10 minutes or so. So a device like that is very similar to do that, is very similar to the water electrolysis de device. So in concept, this is kind of what it looks like. We have, we have a, a cell. Um, this is filled with electrolyte. Uh, the reaction that's happening on the left-hand side is very similar to what's happening in a traditional water electrolysis cell, which is the water oxidation reaction. Really the only sustainable oxidation reaction that you can pair with any of these otherwise energy storing reduction reactions. So water oxidation is just, is, it's, the, it's nature's oxidation reaction, water to oxygen. On the right-hand side of the cell is where the difference is. Rather than producing uh, hydrogen from water, we're introducing N2 from the, the atmosphere and reducing it to ammonia using the, the H comes from the water. So those protons that are formed on the left transport across, maybe with a membrane involved to become the NH3 on the right. And out it goes in the gas stream as, a, as an amount of ammonia. So there's the concept, um, direct electrolysis to produce ammonia. However, it's easy to describe. Um, in fact, it's, it's even thermodynamic not as difficult as it might sound. A lot of chemists would, would think of ammonia and go, wow, well, that's a very tightly bonded molecule, triple bond. Um, very, very hard to break those three bonds and, uh, and break it up into ammonia. And the answer is thermodynamically, that's not quite as, as tough as it sounds. It's actually easier to, to reduce, that's what the numbers tell us, than, than protons are. Uh, in other words, it's easier to reduce N2 than it is H plus um, to the reduced form. However, in actual fact, it's much harder to do than that, than that signs. And one particular problem is that in, in water, if that's the desired solvent, then nitrogen is, has a very low solubility. And therefore, um, you're trying to react something in this solution, the nitrogen, that is just sparingly present. Whereas the thing that's competing with you for, this, for these electrons to, re to be reduced is the water, which is the solvent. There's lots of it. So very hard to overcome the competition on, uh, from the hydrogen producing reaction. And a mixture of ammonia and hydrogen is, is, is not as useful as it might sound. It's, uh, it's, it's difficult to separate and it's hard to use it in its own right. So nonetheless, there's been an avalanche of, of, of work in, uh, in this aqueous NRR, the nitrogen reduction reaction, NRR. Um, in the last two or three years, there's been an absolute avalanche of papers on this um, in the literature. And unfortunately, because of this problem of, of the competition from the hydrogen reaction, most of them are very, 
low in selectivity, meaning that most of the current or the electrons that you're supplying as a reactant effectively are going into hydrogen production, not ammonia production. And the, and the yields are so low, we're talking nano scale low, um, that it's very prone to false positives. And one of the reasons for the false positives is that um, almost all of the nitrogen oxides, so nitrous oxide, NO2, et cetera, nitrate, nitrite, all those things that are very common around us and in chemical and gas supplies are all much easier to reduce than N2 is. So very, very prone to false positives. And now we've got a, quite a lot of commentary about this, including from our group and, uh, and a, a number of papers refuting other papers that claim to have made great strides in this area. So quite a fraught area. And uh, it's tempting, we've actually put this in print, <laughs> it's tempting to, to suggest that this, is, this could become another example of a cold fusion. So, you know, hopefully um, most of you around are old enough to remember that era in the 1990s where, um, where, where it was thought that the electrochemists of the world had produced a, a cold fusion reaction in an electrochemical cell until it was proven to be a spurious result. Not just one result, but many, many results. And, uh, and, and that was called at the time an example of, of pathological science. Um, and I, I can explain more what pathological science is, but it's not good. So moving on, uh, you ask, well, is, is there an answer to all of this? There are other ways to carry this Gen 3 reaction out, and it's not using necessarily water. Um, so the work that we've done now in recent times is focused on and what's called the mediated approach at the top of this slide. So a continuous um, mediated approach, which as you'll see, can produce very high selectivity and rate um, at the cost of some energy efficiency. So the question is, can we tolerate that? But certainly it's, uh, it's way beyond any, any uh, doubt about whether it's actually doing what, we're, what we, uh, we and others are saying that it's doing. How does this work? Okay, this is a structure for the cell that is a little bit like a lithium battery. So we have a we have an anode, which is the thing that I've talked about before, carrying out the oxidation reaction of either hydrogen or water. Um, we have a, a, a copper cathode, and this is just like the lithium battery, and we have lithium ions in the electrolyte that act as what we call a mediator. What that means is it's 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 involved in the reaction, but it's not used up in the reaction. So in in the sense, it's a, it's like a catalyst, um, and how it, it does so is it uh, on reduction with electrons it reacts possibly to form lithium metal itself we're working at those kinds of potentials um, but lithium metal is very well known to react with nitrogen if it's present in this case in the electrolyte and the electrolyte's not water anymore it's um, it's a, a typical solvent that's much more stable and water like um, like an ether the thf is the one we choose um, a lithium metal reacts very rapidly with nitrogen to form lithium nitride, Li3N, which is this purple stuff we draw here on top of the cathode. And then in the, in the presence of something that's carrying a, just a, a sufficiently acidic proton, so we call this molecule BH here, um, then, then the lithium nitride, again, known chemistry, um, reacts with the proton and um, forms ammonia regenerates the lithium, which goes around another cycle. But importantly, in the work we've published recently, this, this, this thing that carries the, the green proton um, has, has to itself to be recycled. It has to cycle back to the anode where the protons are being generated and continuously go around this loop, which was completely absent in this concept previously. Um, so how we did this was, um, you know, was this, this little bit of work that we published recently in science was all about what is B, what is B in this picture? The rest of it is, had been known before. And B in this case is, you know, now we're into some, some deeper um, chemistry, um, for a, a, a part of effectively um, uh, organic chemistry, but my group had come across it before because these molecules may make beautiful ionic liquids, these things called these phosphonium cations. But the phosphonium cations are, are also well known to, to carry out this process where the hydrogen on the carbon next to the, P, the phosphorus, the P, so the hydrogen in green is slightly labile. It's slightly able to be removed. Or in other words, in another person's language, it's slightly acidic. And the, the thing that's produced by that um, is called an illide molecule, this, this uh, unusual P bond C uh, molecule. So it's released its proton. The illide goes, it goes back to the anode to pick up another proton. And it becomes the thing that cycles itself cycling between the, the cation and the illide form. 
otherwise everything else is the same. So, the, so there's the concept, there was the hypothesis. And the first thing we had to do was really prove that this could work. And, and we decided to do it in a sort of a brute force chemical fashion so we could do it repetitively and make sure that it was happening. Um, so our, um, one of our postdocs, Carolina Matasek, so, who some of you will know, did this, um, followed this by NMR. Um, so starting at the top, she, she, she takes this, she measures the NMR and the phosphonium cation in this case, it's, it's one that's got three hexyl groups and a, a long carbon-14 tail on it. it. Produces a very sharp signal, just above 30 in the phosphorus NMR. After hitting it with a, an excess of lithium nitride and producing ammonia from that, the phosphonium cation in, in the middle in B is almost completely gone, and the illide is very sharply observed around, uh, around 10 ppm. And then by adding a proton, uh, a, a simple acid, acetic acid in this case, to the mixture, she's able to regenerate completely the, um, the phosphonium cation and the light is gone. So this, and this can be done repetitively to show that this, um, this process is able to be carried out in a, in a cyclical fashion, which is required. Otherwise we're using up the, the phosphonium and we can't do that. So far, so good. Um, and at this point, have I got time for this? Yeah, um, I'm gonna let, let the guys have a little bit of more of a look in here. And uh, here are some of the people actually working on this in the lab who made this little video um, to describe what they were doing. Um, so here we go. The phosphonium salt we use is actually a liquid, often referred to as an ionic liquid. The phosphonium cation has a well-known tendency to act as an acid. In other words, it can give up a proton or two. It is a very weak acid, and that is probably what we need here so that we don't have too many other set reactions going on. Once the proton has detached, the neutral molecule form is called an elite and has a double bond between the carbon and the phosphorus atoms. And this is what give it a very special property. One of our senior research fellows, Dr. Karuna Metasek, will explain how this helped to generate ammonia in a bit more detail. At the molecular level, positively charged proton carrier is initially attracted to the negative working electrode. The electrode surface is covered with the highly reactive lithium nitride. When it reaches to the surface, the proton carrier molecule releases one of its protons to the lithium nitride, in the process becoming what is known as an elide compound. The elide, now neutral, diffuses away, clearing the surface for a second proton carrier to deliver its proton. A third step like this finally produces a fully formed ammonia molecule, which diffuses away from the electrode. The positively charged lithium ions remain near the electrode, ready to form more lithium nitride. And now I will hand over to a Huang Long, who will show you how to do this in the lab. So here we are in an argon fuel glow box. We don't want to handle our cell in the air because that can introduce nasty contaminants. We, our experiments are carried out in the cell, such as this, um, with a fixed quantity of nitrogen gas and electrolyte. Here is the couple working electrode with the cylindrical outer electrode is an anode. This is the core reference electrode which allow us to monitor what is happening on the surface of the copper electrode. Fill up the cell with the electrolyte. And then we bring outside the globe up, introduce the nitrogen gas as much as 20 atmospheres of pressure. So we will start experiment we run this for three days. Afterward, it's the time to measure how much ammonia has been formed. In this lab, we have two main methods of quantifying ammonia. The first one involves the generation of a highly colored compound. This compound can be easily read by a spectrometer such as this one. We have developed a particularly careful variant on this technique called the method of standard additions. Now, this requires a generation of a whole suite of standard solutions in order to test one sample. This can be quite labor intensive and can unfortunately generate a whole heap of plastic waste. The other method that we use is NMR analysis. 
Now, this technique is particularly exciting because we are able to measure the signal coming directly off the ammonia molecule itself. If we are particularly excited by a recent result, what we can do is use a slightly heavier gas called N15 nitrogen. And what this does is it can produce a completely different signal to the normal N14 gas. So uh, I had to cut that off there because it goes on for quite a few minutes longer. Uh, that's on YouTube if anybody wants to see the whole thing. Um, and I should say that Beck here was, was uh, effectively one of the world's leader, leaders in developing that NMR methodology to, uh, to get that really pinned down as a, and it has become the critical step in, uh, in avoiding those false positives. Um, and then just to bring you completely up to date with where that is, that, that the work that was in that science paper is very much a COVID story. Um, it was all happening uh, very much during the in and out lockdowns of, of last year. Um, uh, in fact, um, somebody uh, had to, we were lucky to have met most of the guys in the labs uh, for a good part of the time. So the lockdown wasn't as severe in our research as it could have been. But uh, but of course, uh, Sasha and I, as the leaders, were were not in the lab much at all. And at one point recently, somebody had the temerity to suggest that maybe um, maybe uh, the the buses being away had been a good thing. So we'll have to take that, take that into account. Um, but uh, moving on, though, from into the latest results. Um, Oh, since since that paper was largely wrapped up uh, almost a year ago, um, here's here's sort of some typical numbers from from a recent paper that's now submitted, um, and what you see here is is this is the typical sort of result set. Um, we have on the left hand side we've got the actual yield measured in various experiments over a, a period of time. In this case, is up to um, is up to four days of continuous running, um, and the slope of that line is is the rate at which it's generated, um, and it's normalized according to the area of the electrode that's involved. And the concept being that as you scale the electrode, everything should just scale in a proportion to that. Um, so that number then, even though we, it's got nanomoles in it, that should be a, a bit of an alarming warning. But when you convert that to some more um, practical units, that corresponds to about 2.2 kilograms of ammonia per square meter of electrode per day. So that's that's a practical result. But, but more, much more important um, and scientifically important, I think, is the is the blue data, which is what, what we call the Faradaic efficiency. You could call this the cell activity. Um, this is the fraction of current that goes into the cell that actually turns up, according to Faraday's law, as ammonia. Um, and uh, the, this, this hydrogen problem that I've talked about before uh, as being a competitive reaction has been largely, um, I would say this is within, within CUI of 100% here. So we're largely uh, avoiding that, um, that alternate reaction here. So nearly 100% uh, selectivity towards ammonia. And that's a, that's a world first uh, by quite a large step um, from previous results, including our own science paper. Um, so where are we headed next with that? So um, we, the, the, a lot of this work has been done up to this point with funding from uh, ARC through, through our Center of Excellence and then substantial program funded by ARENA. So, so, uh, so f full credit to ARENA for having the vision to fund work like this. Um, and that's then taking us through a series of, of, of what we call mark, marks uh, of different cells. The one on the top left was, was called a, a hockey puck by, um, by a visitor from uh, the journal Science and the, from the US. So you can sort of, that's where the, the hockey puck sort of name came from. Um, and the one that we're in the foreground, uh, we call Mark, or that's about the size of a big iPhone. And as I'll talk about in a moment, that's already big enough to, to be a um, generator of ammonia for fertilizers on a distributed scale. It's a very important concept. And um, we're, we're aiming to go further than that. We've got marks four and five already very much in the, on the concept um, going boat. We've spun out, as Perrin said at the beginning, a company called Jupiter Ionics um, to, to pursue this. If you wonder <laughs> where did the Jupiter Ionics business come from, um, uh, as all Star, Star Trek fans, all Trekkies should know, uh, Jupiter has an atmosphere that's largely composed of ammonia. That's the link. Um, that wasn't my idea, by the way. Um, uh, and uh, we've been very fortunate to attract um, um, 
funding for Jupiter from a, a number of, of uh, high net worth families uh, in the in the Melbourne area and, and more recently um, uh, extending into to, to around the country. So so um, the future is looking pretty pretty promising for Jupiter Ionics and going forward to develop those those larger scale ups. But there's plenty of science to be done here as well. Um, I've just mentioned momentarily there the potential to use this in farming, and in fact. This is both the, the obvious um, um, first stage application of this sort of technology. And it's also an important part of the story of, of mitigating climate change because decarbonizing farming is a major part of the, of the, the challenge, the, the global challenge in decarbonization. Um, because the, we have, first of all, the significant carbon footprint associated with fertilizer production. The sad news for all of us is that all of the food we eat is produced with artificial fertilizers that comes from those paper Bosch plants. And therefore, you could consider most of the food that you eat, unless you grow it yourself in your garden or eat beans, um, nothing else but beans, uh, is effectively a fossil fuel product. It's an inconvenient truth. Um, and then beyond that, in fact, so there's a couple of tons of CO2 equivalent per ton of nitrogen um, uh, goes into the into the plant um, uh, pro produced, and that's just in production of the fertilizer. And then, if you look at the whole conversion, distribution, application, and, and other farm operations, there's another two to five tons of CO2 equivalent per ton of, of nitrogen. Um, so there's, a, there's an, an important and substantial uh, quantity of, of um, CO2 equivalents to, to dispose of, so we say, um, uh, as part of this bigger problem. And this kind of technology is part of the answer. So, so ammonia is already used directly as a fertilizer. Um, that's not necessarily the, uh, the, the only way to use it, but just to point out that it already is, as you see in the, in the picture. Um, uh, and the, the, the point that we're making here is that by making fertilizers at a, at a distributed scale, we can make the whole, the whole process, not just the generation of the fertilizer carbon free, but we can lower the carbon intensity of a lot of the rest of the process and therefore lowering the CO2 emissions, um, uh, equivalent emissions substantially. And one of the key points is to do with this nitrous oxide, nitrous oxide um, footprint that we talk about there. Um, distributing fertilizers as ammonia uh, or urea on, onto fields is actually a relatively poor way of distributing N into the plants because the, um, the uh, reduced form of nitrogen sits in the soil and slowly oxidizes. And at one point or other, um, often goes through the N2O stage of, of oxidation of nitrogen, which is volatile and evaporates off the field. And N2O is, is something like 300 times more efficient as a greenhouse gas than CO2 is. So N2O emissions from fields because of inappropriate um, application of, of fertilizers is actually quite a big issue in this picture. So we think we've got part of an answer to that. And here's an example of how this sort of thing can work. So. So if we have our ammonia from our uh, on-site ammonia generator, so it could be as small as that iPhone. This would be this would be true for for a, a greenhouse, maybe maybe a greenhouse slightly smaller than the one you see in the picture. But the the point is that the device isn't doesn't need to be huge, and the power demand is not all that substantial. Um, uh, we're also looking at how to uh, avoid the N2O problem by internally generating the oxidized forms that the plants really want to see, uh, which is nitrate. So, so further oxidizing or oxidizing the ammonia up to nitrate form, first of all, as ammonium nitrate or almost all the way through to, for example, potassium nitrate, um, which is one of the um, uh, superb fertilizers. If you're growing tomatoes, you want basically potassium nitrate and a few minerals. Um, then this is, this is the picture and it avoids the N2O uh, losses as well. So an important part of that overall um, uh, greenhouse gas abatement uh, issue. So, so let me go back though, before I'm gonna wrap this up to, um, to you thinking of it as a fuel. And I wanted to compare it here with uh, other kinds of fuels that are used in various parts of the world. And I've done a, a on the back of the envelope calculation at the top. Our energy, you, you, might, you might recall uh, when I introduced our process uh, at the beginning, I said it had high selectivity, which I've shown you, it had high rate, which I've shown you, but at the cost of some energy efficiency. So here, here's where it could hurt. Um, so we're currently about 25% energy efficient. That's electrical energy in compared to ammonia energy out. 
Um, or in other words, we, we, it costs us about 20 kilowatt hours of, of energy to produce a kilogram of ammonia. Haber-Bosch would be about um, 10 kilowatt hours and the ammonia itself has five kilowatt hours of, of useful energy in it. So Haber-Bosch is about 50% uh, on a good day. Most plants are maybe a little lower than that, maybe 40% um, ish um, energy efficient. We're at about 25 and trying to make that better. How does this stack up then? Well, if you if you figure on large scale or um, or uh, consuming power off of grids where it's not so much needed because too much solar or too much wind coming into the grid, that's a common or garden problem these days. We could imagine a, a future where power is available as, as, as cheaply as one cent a kilowatt hour. And there are already large scale power contracts being done at one cent a kilowatt hour. So that is not complete pie in the sky. Um, then you do, do some arithmetic around that and, and add in a, a guess of the capital cost of the equipment. You could imagine making um, ammonia for 30 cents a kilogram. Um, I know and you can see about two thirds of that is the energy cost, right? So, so ammonia here is, is liquid energy. So then let's compare that 30 cents a kilowatt hour. Once converted into um, uh, cost per actual um, kilowatt hour of, of useful energy. So that's in this table, just concentrate on the right hand column. What you see then is, is ammonia costs on that base basis would cost about um, 5.8 cents per kilowatt hour of useful energy um, to produce. Whereas diesel is currently at about 8.3 cents in, um, and that's US based and that number LPG in Germany, 7.9 cents, gasoline in Japan, um, 15 cents. And the cheapest of all fuels, because it's such a, a crude fuel, dirty stuff, um, bunker fuel for ships, that's what they call it, bunker fuel, um, is about 5.5 cents. So you can see how ammonia is already possibly um, uh, an inexpensive uh, option for all of those sorts of you know, applications of, of other uh, hydrocarbons. Um, I wanted to make sure we spent some time um, on making sure on the reality check here um, that we're not ignoring the potential impacts of, of all that exciting discussion on, on, the, on our atmosphere, on our planetary systems. We clearly don't want to reproduce the, um, repeat the mistakes of the um, carbon dioxide problem by simply shifting it to becoming a nitrogen, nitrous oxide problem. Right. So there is the potential of this to be true. This diagram um, summarizes um, from a paper by Fowler et al. Um, uh, and I strongly recommend this, this uh, family of papers in that um, reference, if anybody wants to dig into this. This is a, a summary of, of all of the, the, the flows in the planetary nitrogen cycle. So the nitrogen in the atmosphere, the various reduced forms of nitrogen on, on land and ultimately in the ocean. Um, and I can't go through, I won't go through all of this because there's a, a lot in this, um, and, but let me just pick out a few features to, to emphasize what we know and what we, what we don't know. So first of all, you, you, you do the, the bookkeeping on this and you can um, add up the fact that the total conversion of nitrogen uh, to reduced forms of nitrogen or reactive nitrogen today is about 413 teragrams per year. And about half of that is anthropogenic. That's, I'll point those out in a minute. Uh, half of that's due to us, half is natural processes. Do the bookkeeping and add up um, the total that's returned to the atmosphere or deposited in, in a known form. Somewhere, I look at broad this range is somewhere between 250 and 350 teragrams per year. The first thing you notice is those numbers don't add up. So there is, my point here is simply, there is quite a lot that we don't know and I think in, con in contemplating a future um, energy system based on N, we need to know more about what's going on here. Um, secondly, just as a, as a point of awareness for us all as we eat our lunches in a moment, um, only 17% of, of the anthropo anthropogenically produced um, nitrogen is actually consumed by us. So, so this is the agricultural biological nitrogen fixation. That's um, about 60 of the, on these numbers. And the Haber-Bosch process globally, about 120 is, is the numbers that I'm talking about. Um, most of that ends up not, not going through us in, in our food. It's, it's, it's either lost from, from the, the system or it's, it's used in producing the animals that ultimately are part of our food supply. So you can see how it, 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 the ultimate that comes through us gets, um, gets whittled down. Nonetheless, what does happen to all of that? Well, 
uh, a lot of the nitrogen that we eat and, and most animals eat ends up as nitrates um, being passed through us. And you ask, well, where does that go? It's fairly obviously it goes into the, into the, um, the uh, aqueous system and ultimately into the oceans. But do we know what goes on there? So approximately due to, due to um, anthropogenic nitrogen fixation, the, the marine processing load of nitrates or uh, NOxs generally is about two times um, has increased two times due to the anthropogenic load. And the interesting th thing there is with with um, NOx forms um, ending up in the in the oceans like fertilizing oceans. So one of the points about all that is just to illustrate all the things that we don't really know about, uh, about what goes on. It's not completely uh, a settled part of, um, of science. I think hopefully Perrin will agree with that. But my point here is just to, is to always to advocate for much greater um, funding and, and effort into understanding all of this if we, if we plan to do more in reducing nitrogen out of the atmosphere. It's important that we understand that it all goes back into the atmosphere. And that, that's a, a good point for, for further discussion in a moment. Um, I can say more about that, but there is, there is a clear recognition in all of those engine technologies that I talked about before about the need to control the NOx production um, and to and to uh, to minimise the um, the losses of ammonia in the atmosphere in, in production and handling processes. And as I say, I can I won't say it now, but I can say about it in a few minutes' time. Talk a bit more about how that NOx mitigation is actually handled, for example, in a jet engine. That's already a, an understood problem. So. With all of that in mind, I've hopefully convinced, this is my summary slide, I hopefully convinced you that we can do a lot of the things that are on this slide. So on the left, we can generate all this lovely energy renewably. Um, we have these cells in the yellow box um, generating ammonia. Critically, ammonia can be, can be stored in large quantities. That's a routine thing today. Um, uh, that can be stored as part of pipelining it and shipping it to other places it can also be partly can be part of a solution to store between seasons um, or to store to um, to flatten uh, flatten intermittency uh, even on an interseasonal or even an inter-year on intra-year basis um, just large storage tanks of ammonia pipelining it shipping it and then of course it can go into farming first and foremost um, but ultimately as a fuel for shipping, heavy, heavy transport in particular is ideal for ammonia and, uh, and maybe even um, aircraft and uh, aerospace. So happy to talk about all those things in, uh, anymore if, if you'd like, but in, before we do that, just thank the, the team back in the labs in Green Chemical Futures Building, um, who are of course the ones that do all this, this uh, wonderful work and um, hopefully will continue to do so um, as we push forward with all of this. So thank you for the chance to tell you about all this, and I'm very happy to discuss it in um, any further depth that's needed. Thanks very much, Doug. Um, fascinating talk. Uh, if I if I may say just a quick, couple of quick thoughts on the nitrogen cycle relative, uh, with respect to what you're saying. So the, the current thing with the nitrogen cycle is we're deliberately dumping a lot of it into the environment in, in the context of agriculture. So uh, that's very different to sort of leakage, which I think can be avoided with obviously just stopping leakage and also catalysis of uh, the waste products. And the other key thing, I think, um, with, the, with the increasing uptake of EVs, I think there'll be a massive reduction in the amount of NOx that's release, released from, from combustion engines. So that's actually, you know, as we move into a future economy, I suspect, I, I haven't done the numbers on it, but uh, the reduction in NOx emissions uh, in a sort of decarbonised economy uh, will be significant just, just from, from, from internal combustion. Quite, quite right. I mean, I think, you know, electric vehicles is definitely a big positive here. That's, that's one of the numbers. If you look at the little car sort of, sort of um, middle left or leftish on the picture, that's the little car. So that's the, that's the vehicle emissions part. That NO40 is uh, quite a significant part of, of emissions back into the atmosphere. Yeah. All right. I've got lots of questions, but I don't want to hog the, um, Hold the stage. So um, I'll throw it open to the floor. Just just pipe up if you've got any questions. All right. Um, unless I've missed something, no no one's piped up. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to ask uh, start asking questions. So um, with with the um, 
just sort of on the on the technical side of the of the cell that you're talking about, Doug. How how in in principle is the, I assume it's going to be a sort of continuous flow system where 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 it operates continuously. Right? Obviously, your trials are in. Well, I understood your trials are in batch mode. How how is the produced ammonia then sort of released or extracted? Yep, that's um that's a, a good question. So yes, um, continuous mode is highly 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 desirable i mean our our um um the the cells we call them mark one cells the cells that you saw um the the, the team using in the lab in the video uh, are are batch that's a batch process so the, the ammonia accumulates inside that cell and the and the nitrogen gets used up that's not that's not ideal at all for any kind of um, practical process so these these cells are all designed on a flow principle and then the ammonia has got to be separated. So we're actually working on that at the moment. We've got, a, we've got two or three, three options, shall we say, for doing that. A, li a little bit depends on the scale of the, um, of the, the process. For something that is, is part of a small scale that's on the end of a greenhouse, um, of, you know, producing a relatively small amount of ammonia, but plenty for the nitrogen needs of the, of the, the growing plants. Um, we want something that's relatively simple, so to speak. Um, which is probably just going to be a, a, an absorber compound. Um, for, for example, um, there's a, 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 an ionic liquid, just coincidentally, but that's how they became aware of it, is through the ionic liquid community that has been developed by our, um, our friends at the Institute for Process Engineering in Beijing. Um, and this is all published uh, that uh, they are using in large scale for ammonia separation in an ammonia plant. Um, so that seems like an option. So it's an absorber that absorbs the ammonia and then a relatively small pressure or temperature swing will, will release the ammonia. So, to, so it's an accumulator, you see. Um, in much larger scale, in, in the Haber-Bosch process, um, that's done cryogenically. In other words, they cool the gas stream down below about minus uh, 35 or so, at which point the ammonia starts to condense um, out of the nitrogen stream and then the, the nitrogen is re is recirculated. So, the, so nitrogen has to be purified of, of oxygen and water fairly rigorously, as in extremely rigorously, in the Haber-Bosch process, because the catalysts involved don't like to see um, uh, oxidants like, like oxygen. Um, not quite such a problem in, in our case. So, so our, our air separation stage isn't, uh, doesn't need to be quite as rigorous as Haber-Bosch. But nonetheless, cryogenic separation is one of the uh, options for large scale. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, any any other questions? <clears throat> well, I've I've got I've got another one. So um, you you talked about um, using ammonia sort of in the in the context of combusting it, hmm. which um seems quite inefficient. Would it, for example, in the context of ships, would it be better just to crack that into hydrogen and then electrolyze that and have electric motors, would that process be overall more energetically efficient than, than burning it? Um, so that benefits from, I think the answer, I mean, the, the short answer to this is possibly yes, right? Um, because that benefits from the high efficiency of the fuel cell that you might be using to, so the hydrogen fuel cell, yeah, um, is, a, is a highly efficient device um, in energy terms. Comparable to, for example, those gas turbines that I showed. So, so in some applications where a gas turbine is sort of an alternative, um, you know, large scale power production, for example, then you just go straight to the gas turbine. So they're about the same energy efficiency. Um, one of the catches with the, with the separation problem is that you need to separate fairly um, rigorously. This is uh, the, the hydrogen that's produced needs to be separated from any residual ammonia or the, the ammonia, ammonia cracking has to be 100.0% complete. Um, otherwise, for the, the rather sensitive darlings, which are the catalysts in the ammonia fuel cell, they're very easily poisoned. So, so the issue there is making sure that the ultimate hydrogen stream is, is sufficiently pure. Um, so that maybe is something for future development in, in fuel cells is to make them a bit more robust in, in regard to the, the hydrogen supply that's coming at them. But, um, but possibly um, <coughs> apparent, and that's why I think 
for example, in, in the vehicle application, if so, I, in, in my view, I think electric vehicles are going to be the answer in, in the streets of Melbourne or the streets of Tokyo. I think um, it's, it's it's just so so much easier to ship large quantities of energy into a city on wires than it is in any other way. Um, but for heavy transport, um, um, other than electrified um, rail, uh, I think we're talking possibly a fuel like ammonia. And you could ask the question then as well, is it better to to store a lot of hydrogen on the vehicle, on the truck running to Sydney, for example, as opposed to ammonia. Well, the problem there is just the sheer quantity that's needed and the refueling and so on, the, the, the infrastructure. And this sort of edges you back towards the liquid fuel on board. Um, and the processing of that probably on board, I think, uh, to make it into a, a fuel cell hydrogen, probably it's going to be simpler just to run the engine. But that's an, that's an open question as to exactly what, what you do with the ammonia and where do you do it before you actually get it into a get, get it on the wheels, get the energy to the wheels. Yeah, because if you could if you could do it through that process, that would also boost your equation, that, that calculation you went through at the end where you showed ammonia is competitive with, with other fuels. Um, but Correct. it could be even more competitive if because the efficiency is the other thing, of course, not just energy density. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So Correct. Could, Correct. Potentially. Yep. Yep. The right yep. technology boosts that a bit. Yep, quite right. I, I, I've been hogging the question, so, so someone else must have a question. There is a question in the chat. Yeah. In the chat. Yeah. Um, I'm just reading it as well. Um, let, me, let me read this out as I contemplate it. Literally revealed that lithium mediated process has only one electric chemical process that is lithium deposition. Other steps are chemical. So what's your take on the future development of this process? Will it be improvements in the electrochemical side or engineering side to make chemical steps faster? Um, I, I, that is all, all a, a correct summary of the situation. Um, I think there's, <laughs> uh, Mahmoud, there is, Improvements needed on everything, I think, is, this, is the simple answer to that. So to maybe to expand that question a bit for the, the non-chemists the non who are listening. So the, the process that I described um, for the production of ammonia in our cell um, has a number of steps of, of di discreetly identifiable steps um, that, uh, that, that are involved. And some of those we would describe as electrochemical, meaning that they involve an electron coming out of the electrode. And then there are other steps like the protonation of the lithium nitride, um, which are simple chemical steps, right? So there's no electrons involved. And when you have a, a series of reactions that are all required to happen in sequence um, before you get your product, it's quite important to understand which one might be rate limiting under under any given circumstances in order to um, a avoid side reactions taking over and b just to make the best of the of the rate itself um, so and Mohammed is asking well wh wh where do we think the, the the steps forward might be and I think the answer is probably in 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 both but but of course there are more chemical steps so there's a good chance that the um the outcome is going to be one of the chemical steps is where um, a, a further advance might be remembering that we can without too much trouble or penalty we can punch up the elect the electrochemical rate just by by punching up the voltage that's one of the one of the um, uh, sort of uh, amazing advantages of electrochemistry is that you can push reactions along just by dialing up the voltage. Uh, it costs you a little bit more energy, but but you get a much higher rate as a result if nothing else goes wrong. All right, we, we're um, heading towards time. Um, one last chance for a quick question from the audience. Well, if not, I, I think one, one final interesting point is I'm not a huge fan of biofuels, but I saw an interesting point made recently that, you know, as you said, um, nitrogen or the production of ammonia releases a lot of CO2. And, and of course, biofuels need, need fertilizer to, to, to be produced. So, so um, you know, that's another fossil fuel subsidy to the biofuels. So this potentially, if, 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 if you do want to use biofuels, it's a sort of, uh, one way of cutting out the fossil fuel subsidy, but I, I'm not, uh, as I said, you know, maybe there's some niche applications where it's necessary, possibly jet fuel, but but uh, I think that's another nice um, aspect to this. Yeah, I totally agree. Totally agree. 
And uh, and Perry, maybe if I've got if I can have last word, um, unusually I'll have last word. Um, uh, <laughs> in this, um, just in case anybody uh, didn't uh, quite sort of get the uh, uh, from all of this, how we could solve the Boyne Island aluminium smelter that's so very important to some of our Queensland senators. Um, the government is talking about technological solutions, so here is one. So the answer is simple: forget the Carmichael coal mine, build huge solar um, and ammonia production facilities, could be Gen 2, could be Gen 3, doesn't matter. Um, um, we can pipeline and, and tank store that ammonia for, for months to years. So, so leveling out the, which aluminium needs, um, leveling out the, the power supply is no problem. It's just a big tank of ammonia. Um, uh, which can be right on site at Boyne Island or, or somewhere nearby. And then we have one of those lovely Mitsubishi um, power generators running uh, on the ammonia, powering the uh, Boyne Island aluminium smelter continuously as it needs to be problem solved. Thanks, Doug. I think that's a great last word. Some, some tips to the, uh, to the Queensland uh, nationals. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we did have, uh, we, we thought you, that, that picture where Senator Birmingham turned up with the, um, with the Minister for Energy and et cetera from Japan, from Tokyo, um, um, Senator uh, Canavan was supposed to, to join. Um, and, uh, but on, and we were ready uh, for that. There's a poster on one of the walls outside the labs. It's uh, emblazoned with the title, um, Ammonia, Australia's New Coal. And then we go into the, uh, how we could replace coal for our energy supply. And so we were all ready to try to, to bowl him over, so to speak, but we didn't get the chance. But I think Senator Birmingham got it, seriously, got it, got the point, got the idea. So, so. Yeah, yeah, I think so. he's, he's probably no doubt very cornered by the, the imagined politics. <laughs> yep. Anyway, thank you very much, Doug. Um, that was a fantastic yeah. talk. I really loved it. And I'm sure everyone else did as well. Um, uh, yeah, thank, thanks very much. Um, I think this was probably our last online one, um, depending on how the open up preparations go. Um, so next month's um, talk is by Carla Sigaro from the uh, Department of Biology or School of Biological Sciences, I should say. And I'm hoping that we'll be face to face and we'll also bring back the posters then. So uh, with that, I think we'll, we'll leave it there. Thanks, um, Anna, again, for, for organising this and, and working things in the background. And uh, it's great to have you all here. Thank you, Doug, and we'll see you all next time. Yep. See you all back on campus sometime soon. Yep. Bye.